Next paper is entitled Lithic Raw Material Differentiation Techniques Demonstration of an Initial Guide to Visual Identification and is presented by Heather Hanna of the North Carolina Geological Survey. Okay, today I'll be talking to you about a guide I'm working on for the identification of lithic material. Now, identifying the rocks of the North Carolina Piedmont can be hard. And it can be hard to geologists as well, so that may or may not make you feel better. But I'm hoping that this guide will make the process a little less painful. Now, it came about because Phil and I spend a lot of time walking through the woods, uh, collecting data on the rocks we find to make the geologic maps he was showing in the last talk. And throughout the years, we have come up with this um, kind of mental flow chart that we use for the rock identification. And so this guide was my, or is my attempt to take the part of that mental flow chart that is relevant to lithic material and put it down on paper as an identification guide. Now there are a few caveats. I want to put out before we really start discussing the guide. Uh, first of all, is that this is not intended as a geologic rock identification guide for the Carolina train. And that's because I focused on those rocks and those textures that are um, most likely to be used in lithic material and, and making of tools. And as such, it's not geologically comprehensive. There are rock types and textures that aren't in there. The second caveat, and this might be the most painful, is that a fresh surface is important for rock identification. And as such, you may need to sacrifice a, a flake or, or two from a given, given set of uh, like lithics to do a full identification. Now, I also wanted to give a note on terminology. The terminology in this guide is currently more geological in nature. I'm a geologist. It's what I use in my day-to-day -day work. It is my goal over time through interactions with the archaeological community to bring in more archaeology terms. And ultimately, I'd love to have both in the guide so that if you desire, you, you have a foundation for going and reading geologic literature. And finally, um, this is a work in progress. So I have in my third row there, if Susan and company have been my guinea pigs, and I really, really appreciate their feedback. It's been wonderful. And so I actually include my email address in the, the guide so that you can contact me with your feedback. And I, I plan to make um, revisions as we go along to, to incorporate more what the archaeological community needs from the guide. Some information about the flowchart, uh, or information about the guide. The guide consists of uh, three portions currently. There are two flowcharts, a frequently asked questions section, and a glossary of terms. Now the two flowcharts are meant to be used in a particular order. The tough lava or sedimentary rock would be used first. And then if lava is one of your options at the end, you can use the composition of lava's flowchart to figure out if you have a basalt, an andesite, or a dacite to rhyolite. Now the frequently asked questions section contains photographs and detailed descriptions of uh, the textures and features that are used in the flowchart. And the glossary of terms contains brief definitions of the geologic jargon that we do use. So kind of a note on the frequently asked question section of the glossary of terms. Um, geologists, like most fields, when we do a technical definition for jargon, we use more jargon. And I find that makes it unapproachable to people who aren't geologists. And I want this to be approachable to people who aren't geologists. So these definitions, um, while correct and um, they're written specifically for application to lithic material, and they're not um, overly technical and overly complex. We've tried to minimize the use of jargon as much as possible and only use it when necessary. Um, now, this document will be available by email when it's uh, uh, ready for distribution. I have a sign-up sheet actually over there where you can write your name and email address, and we'll send out a nice colored PDF when it's ready. So let's take a look at the first flowchart. 
This may look pretty daunting. As we kind of go through and break it down, I'm hoping it'll look less daunting. And as you use it, hopefully, I don't know if Susan can attest to this, but hopefully it becomes less daunting as you use it and go along. So let's, let's kind of break it down. First, uh, you see the start here box, kind of in the middle there. Now the first decision you need to make is whether it is um, the matrix, and I'm not sure if matrix is a term you all use for us. If you have the bigger class or crystals, it's the stuff in between. You need to look at the matrix with a, a 10 times magnifier hand lens and decide if it's aphanitic or if it's made up of tiny bits, what we would call granular. Now that actually might be the hardest part of the decision tree. And unfortunately it's at the beginning. But this image, uh, I have images from the, the uh, frequently asked questions section uh, are used in this talk. Hopefully this will help you um, differentiate between the two. On the, this side here, on the left, we have a phonetic matrix, and on the right, we have granular matrix. Now, the granular matrix, you can see, is made up of, of bits and pieces, of fragments of other rock, little crystal fragments. Um, whereas the a phonetic matrix looks a lot smoother. Now, it's not perfectly smooth. It's not like glass or homogenous, but hopefully you can see a difference between the two, and over time, you'll be able to train your eye. Okay, once we've made a decision whether the matrix is aphanitic or granular, if it's granular, you go up on the chart, and you actually end up only having two options at that point. Does it have crystals and or class or not? Now, if you decide it's aphanitic, you have a lot more flow chart to go. Now, if you've noticed, we've tried to provide naming options in some key places in case you can't make it to the end of the flow chart. So, if you decide it's aphanitic, the next step is, does it have crystals? Does it have class? Does it have both, or does it have neither? Now crystals, um, we haven't really gone much more into depth in crystals on the flow chart. You can note if you know what, what type of, of uh, phenocryst or, or crystal it is, you can note is it quartz or feldspar, uh, but they're, they're pretty much self-explanatory. The class, however, um, you can have class that don't really, aren't really diagnostic, but you also have two class that we're going to discuss in detail here that can be diagnostic of rock types. So if your option tells you that you have class, you need to decide if it has either of these two that we're about to talk about. So does it have fiamme shaped class? Now fiamme, um, I'm told is Italian for flame. And you can see there are little arrows. For, I, I do you want to say the picture on the left is the wet version of the picture on the right. Uh, kind of zoomed in. This is taken under 10 times magnification on a microscope to try and simulate how it would look under your hand lens. And that one was just taken with an SLR camera. I've also in these images, whenever possible, I've tried to use not just geologic hand samples, but also debitage flakes, artifacts. If that isn't possible, I've tried to use just a little rock fragment or, or something geologic that would approximate how it would look. So you can see the little kind of fiamme, like hopefully people can see the little flame-like structures that are, the arrows are pointing to. And those are characteristic of a welded tuff. So that pretty much gets you to a, a welded tuff as your end result. Now fiamme can be really little, they can be really big. Um, so you might see them on a variety of scales. The next characteristic class that we have is a hyaloclastic class. Now, um, Fiamme, the last slide, those are basically smushed pumice. The hyaloclastic class form, when you have, uh, well, if you've seen maybe on uh, National Geographic or you've been to a volcano and you've seen the, the lava flowing and the, the top surface cools faster and it, it gets um, brittle and the center is still flowing and so as it flows, it breaks up that top surface into to class. That's basically your hyaloclastic uh, texture. And the key of the hyaloclastic texture is it looks like some of the class could fit back together. It's a jigsaw fit. So you can see where the arrows point. It's not a perfect jigsaw fit, but you can see how those class might have gone back together, how they might have fit back together. <laughs> okay, so we've made our decision, let's say, whether it has hyaloclastic class, fiamme, none of the above, crystals, etc. So next you go into figuring out if there are stripes on the surface. Now that's actually 
a lot more of an e easier thing to decide. So um, if there are stripes on the surface, you usually end up with either bedding or flow banding. So let's talk about flow banding first. Flow banding occurs when you have uh, lava flowing. It could be on the surface. It could be in the neck of a volcano. And um, you have the part that's in contact with solid rock. Uh, friction causes that to move slower. And so you get a laminar flow. And then you get those kind of squiggly lines you see up there. Um, figures, uh, the pictures A, B, and D are all of the weathered surface. Uh, B is Morrow Mountain, and it's that characteristic chalky white weathering rind. Uh, D is just a little flake I found in the old arc. Uh, and C is of the fresh surface. But let's look at the weathered surfaces first. So you can see in A, flow banding can be squiggly. Uh, you can see in B, it can be more parallel. Um, hopefully you can see the lines down here. Let's see. And on the fresh surface, you can have some variation of color, but oftentimes you also don't. Like in this, you can see it's a lot less variable in color than what you see on the, the weathered surface. Now bedding. You may be saying, that looks a lot like flow banding. And it can look a lot like flow banding, and I'm still kind of working to put into to, uh, words some of the things that, that make us lean one way or another. But bedding you get in um, rocks like tufts or um, siltstones or sandstones. Flow banding you get in lavas. Now the bedding, uh, these, and I should say all the, the rocks you're seeing in these pictures are sitting over there on that table for you to look at this afternoon and try out the guide. So the picture at the top is again taken under a microscope, 10 times magnification. The picture on the bottom is the entire little flake that I use. That picture at the top is from kind of that area right there. Um, over on the right, we have just a piece of quarry gravel we picked up because it showed the, the bedding on the fresh surface nicely. You can see there's a lot of variation in thickness of the beds. Um, there's also variation in color. Um, you can have those in flow banding as well, but, um, but there are subtle differences that, that can indicate bedding. Like I said, these two can be hard to tell apart. Um, so you go through your entire first flow chart and um, you end up with, uh, sometimes you'll end up with something very specific, like you have a hyaloclastic bedded, or I mean, sorry, a hyaloclastic flow banded uh, lava. Or you may end up with something more general, like you have a tough or a lava. And if lava is one of your options, then you can go to the second flow chart because lavas are characterized by um, composition. And so with this flow chart, you again start in the middle. And the first question is about the weathering rind, which reflects the composition. Is the weathering rind a dark brown? Um, is the weathering rind more of a drab olive brown, may or may not have a lighter interior? Or is the weathering rind light, you know, light cream, light white, uh, or light gray to white? that can have medium brown patches. So let's take some pictures, of, or look at some pictures of that. These are all three side by side. Picture A is a mafic weathering rind. You can see that's a dark brown color. If you look at the broken fresh surface, there's no light in between. It's just dark brown on the fresh surface. If you look in B, the uh, rock on your left is an intermediate weathering rind. And that's a well-developed intermediate weathering rind. You have that drab, um, olive brown on the outside, and you have the kind of greenish gray lighter interior. Now on lithics, you may not have developed that greenish gray lighter interior, so it may or may not be there. And finally on the rock on the right, you see that the interior is a light gray to white, creamy color, the brown's a slightly different shade. It can be a little hard to see in the guide, but hopefully if you hold the two rocks side by side, you'll see the difference um, in the, the weathering rind coloring. And also the brown on the more felsic weathering rind tends to be patchy. It looks more solid on that sample, but if you look actually at the sample, it's a little patchier. So that's how it looks on geologic hand samples. But how does it look, how would it look on, on um, something relevant to y'all's work, a, a piece of cultural debris? So on the left, we have kind of the drab olive weathering rind. And over there, you can actually hold these two side by side and compare the colors. That drab olive weathering rind, um, the arrow is pointing to a broken fresh surface, and you can see there isn't the light interior. This is more the intermediate weathering rind. Um, on 
the right here, you can see, again, the arrow's pointing to the Prussian shear, there's all the light-colored weathering. And there's some brown, but it's, it's more patchy and it's a different shade of brown. So this would be more the felsic weathering rind, and this would be more the mafic weathering rind. Now after you decide which weathering rind you have, then uh, you, uh, we go to how vitric is the sample. And we tell that using frosted flakes. I'm pretty sure this is a fill term, by the way, and not a technical term. Uh, so when something is vitric, it was originally glassy. But these rocks, as Phil discussed, are old rocks. And glass devitrifies over time. But the, the rocks still maintain this characteristic way of breaking that indicates they used to be glassy. And so that are these, what we call frosted flakes. It's a flake, and the tip, you can get a little bit of light transparency through it, so it looks frosted. So these are all different degrees of how vitric something is. In the flow chart, currently, these two would be linked together, and you would end up at a, a dacite to rhyodacite. And this one is separate. You end up at a andesite. Another option is that there aren't frosted flakes, which would take you more to a basalt. So let's look at, at what would be more of your rhyodacite. You can see there's some notable flakes. Those suckers jump out at you. You might even be able to see them without a hand lens. When, um, and you can see there are different sizes of frosted flakes, too. When you look at B, that's more of your day sight. Again, they're pretty notable. You see them, you may also see those without a hand lens. Uh, they tend to be perhaps a little more uniform in size, but again, they're pretty abundant. Now this rock is what Phil and I have dubbed weekly vitric. The arrows are pointing to frosted flakes, but they're not as obvious. You may have to at least initially look a little bit. They're there, but they don't jump out at you. So that's more of a weekly vitric, and that's more characteristic of an andesite. So how would this look on um, cultural debris or something that approximates cultural debris? Up in A, that rock, um, if it were a lava, would approximate more the, the high vitricness of, say, your rhyodacite. B is more your dacite. You can see that's vitric. Hopefully you can see the frosted flakes. And down here in C, there are the frosted flakes, but there aren't a lot of them, and they're not really noticeable. So this is more your andesite composition. Okay, uh, I also have a slide, um, or a, uh, at the very end of the guide, I have some other kind of useful information when you look at the sample wet versus dry, how do you tell a tuff from a lava, if possible. And I also have my contact information, because I encourage you all to send feedback. Again, this is a living, breathing document. Um, it's uh, a big undertaking and, and kind of challenge to actually summarize all these intricate thought processes into a flow chart. And so I'm sure there will be other versions, and we really welcome feedback from the archaeological community. And I know it might seem daunting just kind of going through the talk, but we do have the rocks over there. Hopefully when you get to use them and look through them, it, it will feel less daunting and the, the decisions will become more obvious over time. So if we have time, we can take questions. I have a comment. Mm -hmm. um, so when Heather and I are in the field, a lot of this stuff summarized in the charts are actual feelings that we have. Yeah. Not not something we learned in the textbook. We look at something and we, based on the size of the outcrop, the habit of the outcrop, seeing a whole bunch of the rock, we get this tendency to make a judgment call of what it is. So it's been a very challenging task for Heather to put to write this down. We're taking basically feelings based on our our experience and education of writing it down. So it's, it's hard. It's a challenge. The um, the some of the samples um, with the, the day site and the uh, andesite, the hand, geologic hand samples, those actually have been ground truth geochemically. But yeah, a lot of the rest of the stuff, it's, it's a gut instinct that we've developed over the years, and that can be hard to put, put into uh, wording sometimes. Yeah. This has the potential to be incredibly useful for mm -hmm. us. Um, uh, the, the flow chart, as you said, looked daunting. That's the first time when I pulled it up on the screen, I thought, wow, this is daunting. But, but uh, one thing that uh, my question is, have you looked at, is there a way to key that chart to the, uh, the um, 
the, the existing quarry sources, you know, the Stepanitis, are you familiar with the Stepanitis at all, 2006, the quarry zone? Um, that, I've, I've looked at that. Okay, here. so that that's kind of the uh, touchstone for us as archaeologists. Okay. So is there a way to take this, this flow chart and key it into those rock samples at the RLA? If so, for, for us, okay. what's important I mean, we've got to have nomenclature, right? right? You know, and I understand that. And and it, all this aphanitic, aphoric, and porphyric, it, it's, uh, that, that is important. But for us an archaeologist, what's really important is where the hell did that rock come from, right? Mm -hmm. And so we need to know what it is, but more important, uh, in a way, more importantly, we need to know, try to get an idea of where the source is. So, it, it, so what would really be cool if that flow chart could be linked to okay. those quarry zones okay. that would then standardize awesome. the way I don't know, just my thoughts on that. So you're talking about sets yeah. that are linked into individual core. Well yeah the flow chart if you you know if you're out you know if you're using that flow chart it's kind of daunting but it some of those um, rock types may not be uh, relevant to us as archaeologists, it, like a lot of the class, uh, conchoidal fractures, what we're interested in, right? Mm -hmm. As archaeologists, the, the victim, yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. So if the rock, I mean, for the most, unless groundstone, you know, <coughs> you know, greenstone was used a lot for groundstone tools, but not too much for making points, right? So for us, the key attribute is conchoidal fracture. So I think that kind of limits this broad range. So I, I don't know, I'm just guessing by looking at that, some of those flowchart endpoints may be less relevant to us as archaeologists because they lack a good conchoidal fracture. So we're not going to see much of that in our in our um, assemblages. Does that make sense? In, we'll do it for in, this. The, first, in the first flowchart, um, all of the, the end results have the potential to be vitric. We actually were initially going to take the sedimentary rocks out. And then we started looking through some samples at our initial meeting and there were vitric sandstones in there right okay so that's well, why we decided to uh to leave those in so the first flow chart all of them have the potential to be vitric however if you look through them and you find well this particular texture interferes with making a point so they probably wouldn't have a hyaloclastic rock we can take that out right, right. um that that's part of the feedback and and for linking it uh that's that sounds great to me that's something i would want to work with Leon and, and kind of you know, right. hear his thoughts about Boy, it. Boy, that would be, there must be some kind of grant we can do to do those, right? <laughs> yeah. You know? I mean, no, I'm serious. I'm serious. That, 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 that nomenclature, I mean, that's, this is incredibly useful. Uh, cool. uh, if, if we could link that together, because okay. it seems to me that the, the struggle for us as archaeologists has been to get on a, a common uh, terms, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, this then is the bridge to do. What, what would you think about having kind of like a like maybe a superscript uh, on some of these points like A, B, C, and A, B, and C correspond to um, this quarry site, that quarry site, that sort of thing? Bingo, that's kind of what I was going to say. You follow a flow chart down and you get to a, a porphyritic rhyolite, mm -hmm. and it's got an index number, and you just turn to your glossary, and it says this index number is found at three half mountains. And it's found in this bar okay. and this bar, based on Stephanitis and Penn's work and other people. Great. So that wouldn't be hard for you to do. Okay. As I said to you to do. Yeah. It's not for me to do. <laughs> and we, uh, we, can, we can add a fourth section. Uh, I'd totally be down for adding a fourth section to the, the chart where we have, or to the, the packet where we have, have exactly what you said. The one thing I would, I would just caution mm -hmm. with that is, well, I think it, it would be incredibly useful to say, this quarry, say Horse Trough Mountain Quarry, uh, the stone we've got at that quarry seems to correspond, at least in some areas, because mm -hmm. talking with Phil and Heather, even across the quarry, you, you can mean, have you can variation. Stone. Yeah, you yeah have right. Good yeah. variation. Yeah. So you could say, well, these are the characteristics we tend to see at this quarry. The one thing we want to all be clear on, I, I would think, is we don't want to say every time we find those that characteristics, right. it comes from Horse Trough Mountain. Right. 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 Yeah. So uh, the way I thought about it when I was uh -huh. listening to these guys the first time was kind of the way, and I'm going to break Steve's promise, we're going to kind of, I'm going to talk about ceramics for a second. 
a set of characteristics that we're calling. <laughs> so we're saying these are the things that I am seeing that went through my hand lines and, and my feelings from working with the sample for a while. And these are the characteristics of type A, type B, type C. And I'm going to tell you in my report what those characteristics are that I saw. And, and maybe we can match those to a, to a quarry at, at, you know, say Tater Top Mountain or Moore Mountain or whatever. Or maybe, and maybe it does match those, but maybe it also matches four or five other quarries that we just haven't found. Right. So, you know, yeah. I just want everyone to... Yeah, I, yeah I, to I, 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 I'm sure that um, there's the variability that exists. I, I'm not necessarily saying you can pin it down to a particular oh, amount, right. but, but the quarry zone cluster concept that was put forward. When Bob and I were, were, were looking at it, we had just general sort of uh, uh, a zone that in, tended to incorporate such a variability as he saw it. And I appreciate your subjectivity feelings, because that's, <laughs> I mean, no, I'm serious, that, that is, uh, I was relieved when, you know, we were out of field with Bob, and I, I fully thought, when I started my, my dissertation, you know, that Josh pick up a rock and go, bingo, that's it, right? And there's no question, but, but I, yeah, I know. You haven't I, seen that I, in I the field. A, well, no, I, I was think it's a tough. Naive, no, I, was, I think this is an A-side. Yeah, right, well, that's exactly, that was, I was naive with respect to that, right? And so not unlike us archaeologists when we are, are, are argue over a point type sometimes, right? So, um, uh, but the point is that we, we need to bridge, you know, the, what the, the, the archaeological work Right. With the geologic, you know, and, and, and bridge in some way that 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 makes it even mm -hmm. more useful. And this is great feedback because, like I said, this is a work in progress. The, this early draft is coming from my background, but I want to incorporate your work, your background, what's going to work for you as we go through. Because I envision multiple drafts of this coming out as we get feedback. Now, Susan, you've been using it. Do you have any thoughts or anything you want to add? Well, um, we've been working on uh, an NCDOT project that Shane's going to talk about, and we're working with an incredibly diverse assemblage um, from a site that's primarily archaic. And what the and we're working with the flowchart, and what it's done is it's opened up our eyes to this tremendous variability and things that I might have previously just put in indeterminate metal volcanic and moved on uh, because it didn't fit into you know acre rhyolite, corporate rhyolite, mm -hmm. you know, etc. So we have things like the high elastic mm -hmm. lava in Devotage and in oh, finished cool. bifaces, and we now know what it is, uh -huh. and we're separating it out. And it's a site that has um, issues with deflation and loss of integrity, but what we're focusing on is recognizing patterns within it that might relate to the different periods of occupation, and it's really been um, important to recognize the diversity, and we're kind of trying to take an inductive approach and tease out everything using the flowchart to sort of know what key things to focus on. We're going to worry about exactly what it is later and then if it correlates with quarry sites because we're looking at, at the big picture too, we're going to want to know that. Um, but it's been incredibly useful for right. looking at and recognizing variability. Right. It, it occurs to me too that um, this flow chart could kind of be divided into if, if it works out that some of the these quarry zones that that flow chart flows out to, to, to some quarry zones but uh, there there may be yet quarries stone use that we don't know and so the flow chart may end up with some kind of, of rock that huh we don't really know the source of that so you've got known and then I know that that tells us well we got to go find you know uh, where this other stones come from. So there's there's all kinds of, of, of potential for this. Great, great. And this is wonderful feedback, by the way. Thank you, guys. Kathleen? Hi, I'm a, a colleague of Bill's members, and I want to tell you what a nice little chart that is, but I think that, that, that you should never underestimate something. You actually need a logic chart, mm -hmm. all the scientific logic that a field geologist runs through, and it goes way beyond a feeling. I think it's based on our your collective years of field experience doing the same flow chart over and over and over mm -hmm. in all your different observations. And so I would urge you to design a neural network analysis mm -hmm. without um, so Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And actually, this has been wonderful for me because it's forced me to sit down and put into words <laughs> what we've been doing over the years. So this has been a useful exercise both ways. Mm -hmm.
one little technical thing in terms of uh, the potential to uh, destroy something that you mentioned as a caveat. Uh, if you've got a, a 10x lens, you really don't have to saw something in half if you've got just a fresh, a small yes. fresh yeah. surface. Yeah, like, like with um, some of the, the pieces I showed, they just had a, a little tiny break in them. And that, that can be all you need is just a, a little tiny break. You don't need a, a huge surface. Yeah, you're encouraging shovels wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> I'll add, when Heather and I are in the field, we had a big outcrop, and we're confused to what the rock type is. We will take four or five chunks of it and really look at it. So the more fresh surface, the better for better identification. We'll never go to the National Park <laughs> they, they probably banned us from those and just not told us. 